she prayed and the others leading us in worship. Uh, miss that so much, amen. Ecclesiastes. We'll look at one verse in chapter 1 and then 11 verses in chapter 2. I have my mask that I wear when I go out. And it's about Zion Hill. It's got our logo on there, thanks to Michael Stubblefield, Mike and Gay's son. They make these, and they've made them for some of the other churches. And it has our theme, Knowing Christ and Making Him Known. I've, I've seen some people look at me, and, uh, but I think that's a good way to advertise things for the Lord. I appreciate Mike and them doing this. Before we read the scripture, I do want to have prayer once again. Our nation is in des desperate need of peace, unity, and that's not going to come from our government. It's going to come from the Lord. And uh, I received a couple texts yesterday. One was to me as a sheriff's office chaplain. It was to all of our chaplains to pray because of the protesting that may come here. And then uh, one later on in the day from another source, similar to it. And uh, so, and then another one this morning. Uh, this one was basically, no, nothing's going on right now, but get our churches to pray. Again, this is only going to come from God like it needs to. And for things to be worked out and things to be done as they need to. So, would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that we can bow as a church, as a church family. And Father, we do come to you asking, Lord, for our nation. Uh, Lord, that you would restore peace. Uh, peace, Lord, because the right thing is done. Uh, because righteousness uh, and the law is upheld. We pray, Father, that... All that needs to be done, Father, would be worked out uh, through those in positions of authority. And, Father, we pray that you would keep our law enforcement personnel safe as they uh, try to keep others safe. And then, Father, we pray that you would help us as we look into your word now. Uh, Father, may your message come to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We congratulate also Kaylee Sprouse, uh, Michelle's daughter, and Red and Cassie's granddaughter, because she went through the Scholars program. And, uh, you know, if they'd had that when I was younger, I still wouldn't have went through it. <laughs> I wouldn't have been smart enough, but we congratulate her as well. Would you stand with me in honor of God's Word? <clears throat> Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 14 says, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed, all is vanity and grasping for the wind. The title of this message is Chasing the Wind. And we understand what that would be like. Nothing ever comes from it. Chapter 2, verse 1. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with mirth. And mirth is, is a good thing, a joyous thing, and so forth. Therefore enjoy pleasure, but surely this also is vanity. I said of laughter, madness, and of mirth, what does it accomplish? I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine, while guiding my heart with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was good for the sons of men, to do under heaven all the days of their lives. I made myself great, my, excuse me, I made my works great. I built myself houses and planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens and orchards, and I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools from which to water the growing trees of the grove. I acquired male and female servants and had servants born in my house. Yes, I had greater possessions of herds and flocks than all who were in Jerusalem before me. He's talking about King David, his father. He said, and even Saul, he said, I had more than all that they had. Verse 8, I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the special treasures of kings and of the provinces. 
I acquired male and female singers, the delights of the sons of men, and musical instruments of all kinds. So I became great, and excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my reward from all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done, and on the labor in which I had toiled. And indeed, all was vanity and grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to speak to our graduates in particular with this message this morning, but to all of us in general, because the things that Solomon has tried stand before those who are in school, and it stands in the lives of those adults. Many are doing what Solomon was trying to do, which was to find satisfaction and fulfillment in all the things that he tried. Solomon had the ability to do everything he said. He had the treasures, he had the power and authority. He could do everything that he said. And I'll give you some scripture reference as we go through this to where you can go and read about his riches, his wealth, and so forth. I looked up in, in preparation for this message a list of the richest people in the world. Now, it's not hard for us to know who number one is. It's Jeff Bezos. He's worth $140 billion. Bill Gates is worth $92 billion. He's number two. Warren Buffett is worth $85 billion. Interesting thing about Warren Buffett. He was the son of a U.S. congressman. I didn't know that until I started doing this reading. But he, he bought his first stock at age 11 and filled out his first tax returns at age 13. Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, is worth $73 billion. Uh, that's just barely half of what Jeff Bezos is worth. If your goal is to be rich in life, you would pay attention to what these men say. That makes sense. I've heard people say, my goal is to be a millionaire before I'm 30 years old. And if that was a goal, then you would listen to these men and others, many more on the list, uh, and, and you go down the list to 30, 30 you know, it's easy to find on Google, and you would listen to them, their advice and so forth. Now, let me flip this coin to a different subject on wisdom. Outside of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who walked here on earth, who was considered the wisest man to ever live? Solomon. We know that. Uh, Solomon, uh, he sort of had the corner on wisdom. He even said it in the verses we read that his wisdom remained in him or with him. And I'm going to give you a little bit about how great even his wisdom was, not just his treasures. So when it comes to wisdom, if you want to gain wisdom, would you listen to Solomon? Absolutely. If I would listen to Jeff Bezos, Warren Buffett, and these other guys about riches, then why wouldn't I listen to Solomon about wisdom? Certainly we would. King Solomon was the son of David, we know that, the third king of Israel. He wrote 1,500 songs and 3,000 proverbs. When Solomon spoke, with his God-given wisdom, people listened. Matter of fact, they would travel just to listen to him. He attained great riches and much fame during his lifetime. The Queen of Sheba is one of those who went and she traveled all the way to sit and just listen to his wisdom. This is what she said. It was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. However, I did not believe their words until I came and saw with my own eyes, and indeed, the half of the greatness of your wisdom was not told me. You exceed the fame of which I heard. That's in 2 Chronicles chapter 9. But Solomon, Herbert Locker wrote, 
this, the man who penned and preached a thousand wise things failed to practice the wisdom he taught. He continued on by writing, all rivers ran into Solomon's sea. Wisdom and knowledge, wine and women, wealth and fame, music and songs, he tried them all. But all was vanity and vexation of spirit simply because God had been left out. If you want to write one thing above the introduction to Ecclesiastes in your Bible, you could write a book that was written with God left out. Solomon began to drift from following the Lord. This drift eventually took him very far from the Lord down a slippery slope that ended in dis despair, desperation. This is why the book of Ecclesiastes was even written. Two other books were written by Solomon, Proverbs and Song of Solomon. He warns of the uselessness of seeking fulfillment away from God. It's like chasing the wind, he says. You never catch it. Vanity is used over 30 times in this book by Solomon. The word vanity, it means emptiness. You're left with nothing whatsoever or little meaning. That of little meaning. The term under the sun is used 29 times. And you have to understand this or you'll miss what he's saying in the here. It means earthbound view of things. An earthbound view under the sun. So it speaks of things on earth without God, who is above the sun. Now let me break these down. Solomon has seen it all. Chapter 1, verse 14, I've seen all the works that are done under the sun. He had all the wealth, all the wives, all that the world could give, he had it. All these things in and of themselves brought no fulfillment and satisfaction. Even what he had accomplished under the leadership of the Lord had faded in the time of personal indulgence in the world. Mankind throughout history and up even to our modern times echoes the conclusion of Solomon that the gain of all things without God leaves you unfulfilled and empty. Many have described this as a big hole in the soul of a person. And they keep trying to stuff down in it everything they can to try to fill that void. And they cannot. I could stop right there and we could talk the rest of the time about our daily newspapers, our daily news broadcasts, the, all of the things that talk about the lives of the rich and the famous, all of these. And we see day after day they are trying to stuff down that hole of emptiness in their life. All the things that they can attain. All the things that they can do. And they come up empty every time. Because they're doing it without God. Here's an illustration I had given a few years ago. But it's still very pointed. So I want to give this. A survey uh, years ago of some 7,948 students at 48 colleges were asked what they considered very important to them. It was conducted by John Hopkins University. 16% said making a lot of money was very important to them. 75% said the first goal was finding a purpose and meaning to my life. 75% finding a purpose and meaning to my life. Dr. James Dobson, who many of you have followed over the years like I have, in one of his monthly newsletters years ago, told of a 17-year-old Fremont, California, a girl named Karen Cheen. This is from David Jeremiah's book, Searching for Heaven on Earth. She scored 800 on both sections of the SAT exam. Uh, she also got 8,000, a perfect score, on the University of California's acceptance index. No one had ever done this before. She was a straight-A student at Mission San Jose High School. She thought of herself as a typical teenager. And I read more than what David Jeremiah had to say about this. I, I put it up on the internet as well, very similar to this, but a little more to it. Her teachers described her quite differently. They called her Wonder Woman because she had an unquenchable thirst for knowledge and the ability to retain whatever she read. I've been, I've been around two guys that I know personally. Both of them are ministers. 
they, they only have to read a book one time. They never have to refer back to it because it's a photographic memory. Uh, never have to do that again. This is similar to what this young girl had. When a reporter asked Karen, what is the meaning of life? Her reply was, quote, I have no idea. I would like to know myself, unquote. The meaning of life. The attaining of riches, treasure, fame, even knowledge does not fulfill that thirst for fulfillment. And yet, it's being tried every day. Every day. Somebody's trying it once again because they don't know where to turn or they refuse to turn. Everybody's not in ignorance. Some are just trying it until the day they finally say, that's enough. I'm going to God. They grew up hearing it. They went away from it and so forth. This is the cry of Solomon as he wrote that all things under the sun are vanity. The world tells you that sex, partying, and being with the in crowd, having houses, cars, fame, fortune, and so much more, can once and for all satisfy the soul and give it peace. And we don't have to go far watching TV and so forth to see that that is their claim. Solomon believed that lie, that all these things could bring fulfillment, but he was left empty inside. Listening to, as I've referred to, the, to the actresses, actors and actresses, the popular entertainers of our day, They'll go from one relationship to another, one religion to another, one philosophy to another, one party to another, one drug to another, in search of lasting happiness and peace of soul. They never find it because they have not listened to Solomon, but they have believed the lie of Satan also. I remember years ago, uh, as they called him Neon Dion, Dion Sanders, in the height of his football career, You've seen him come through college as a standout athlete, and then he went on to the NFL. And when he was on the team, when they won the national championship, or excuse me, the, the world, the Super Bowl, as they won the Super Bowl, Dion tells about all the celebrating and so forth, and he went back to his hotel room, and he ordered, I think it was a brand new Lamborghini, went ahead and did it right then, and then he sat in his hotel room and he said, is this all there is to it? And he felt that emptiness once again. They haven't gotten to the high point of his career, what every athlete would want to do. He said, there's nothing here. And Dion later has a testimony of turning to Christ and following Christ where he has found that fulfillment. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, Solomon searched for meaning. I'm going to go quickly through this. This section could be taken right out of our, our headlines of our newspapers today. The search for fulfillment would really be a banner for America because we have riches. We have so much that any other nation would have. People are caught up in this endless search without even knowing it. They're finding the same thing that Solomon did. For Solomon in verses 1 to 2, he looked for meaning and satisfaction and pleasure. Listen, that's a banner that's ahead of all the others of our day and time. If it feels good, do it. Go do this, go do this, have this experience. We're called up on experiences and so forth. But when, we, when we're called up on those for the, for the answer to our void, it will not bring it. This word, word mirth is pleasure, gladness, and joy. David Jeremiah said, for many laughter only breaks the monotony of crying. I've watched people's lives. We now know that that was true with Robin Williams. We now know the rest of the story. Laughter only breaks the monotony of crying. And pleasure is only an intermission to pain. So true for so many lives. In verses three, or verse three, he looked for meaning and satisfaction in wine. The alcohol beverage industry promotes and promises a great time with their product. Solomon found out what so many find out today. The wine is not the answer. In verses 4 through 6, he looked for meaning and satisfaction in work. Uh, personal achievements. 
Uh, many workaholics have worked themselves to death, lost family and so much more, trying to find fulfillment. I heard somebody say years ago, is the sign of being successful a full schedule? Is that what it is? That we finally feel important enough to be busy and to be wanted and needed in our jobs? Work is good, but it is, but not as a workaholic to find fulfillment. In verses 7 through 11, he looked for meaning and satisfaction and wealth. If you read 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 14, Solomon's income just in gold in current dollars of our day, when I did this a couple years, a few years ago, his wealth would have been 304 million a year. 304 million a year. Besides verse 15, the verse after that. Silver was too abundant for them to even count in that day. Verse 21 and verse 27. Verse 23 of that chapter sums up his wealth. Solomon's conclu conclusion of wealth was, Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done and on the labor which I had told. And indeed it was vanity and grasping for the wind, for there was no profit under the sun. There appeared to be momentary enjoyment in attaining his wealth in verse 10, but not lasting fulfillment. Listen, even the Bible says there is pleasure in sin for a season. When somebody tells you they're going to go off here and do this and do this and do this, and they come back laughing and what a time we had, there is pleasure in sin for a season, but that season comes to an end. Perhaps you'll understand that and realize that. Derek Kidner, and I think that this is one of the greatest quotes of this message. Derek Kidner said about seeking fulfillment in pleasures, quote, what spoils the pleasures of life for us is our hunger to get out of them more than they can ever deliver. We're seeking the fulfillment out of something that can never give that. It can never do it. And we continue to do it, seeking for that. Let me wrap this up and bring it home with a few questions. Where are you headed, and will you take God with you? If you ever have to leave God at home to go where you're going, understand the results of that. If you ever have to leave God in your life to be with a certain person, to do a certain thing, whatever it may be, you have to understand what the end of that is going to be. We don't do it necessarily thinking that's what I'm doing, but we want to hide that in our life. We want to push that away from us. The next question is, who is guiding you? Again, if I wanted to understand wisdom, then I would read the Bible. The book of James talks about the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. And it details that. It, it, it explains the difference between them. I would ask you to surrender your life to the Lordship of God. I would ask Anna and Erica, <coughs> along with the rest of us, you surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Have the time of your life serving God. Give Him everything you've got. And get truly the most out of life by serving Him. There is no greater thing to know than that you're doing exactly what God has built you to do. I'm, I'm chopping at the bits to preach a message out of Psalm 139 that I alluded to out here the other week about how we were made intricately. Nobody in this room was made just like another person. I don't care if you've got a twin somewhere. You are not made just like someone else. You are made individually. And this is going to sound funny, but I mean it in the... In the most sincere sense. God wanted me to be five foot six. <laughs> he wanted me to be a policeman because he did, he was developing me and doing so many things in there. He wanted me to have asthma because it would keep me from doing some things that I should not do early in my life. He made everything about me that which I consider a strength and that which I consider a weakness. If everything about me was strength, I wouldn't think I needed God. 
I said I was going to buy, I said I was going to preach that later, didn't I? Not today. But when we understand that God made us, and He wants to work through who we are, how liberating that is, how great that is. Save yourself from useless heartaches. There are heartaches that you cannot stop, but there are things you can, that you can avoid and miss by following Christ. For it is going to come. Our invitation is going to be different. I will have a mask if you do want to come forward. I will. But what we're really going to do, for, uh, Dean is going to play, Dean and Yvonne, and I want to ask you to bow your heads. And I want you to consider the message of Solomon. Look past Keith Davis and listen to the words of Solomon. And you are wise for taking heed to what he says. You are wise for saying, my life will not be one chasing the wind. I will not chase the wind. How foolish that is. My life will be characterized as wise by walking with God and enjoying it to the fullest that God wants to do.